My name is John Steinbeck. I was born and raised in Salinas, some 23 miles from here, but I spent a lot of time as a boy and as a young man around Cannery Row. In fact, a few years ago, I wrote a book uh, about Cannery Row. It took me a while to come up with a title for it. Finally, I decided on Cannery Row. And here's the first paragraph of that novel. Cannery Row in Monterey in California is a poem, a stink, a grating noise, a quality of light, a tone, a habit, a nostalgia, a dream. Cannery Row is the gathered and scattered, tin and iron and rust, splintered wood and chipped pavement, weedy lots and junk heaps, sardine canneries of corrugated iron, honky-tonks, restaurants and whorehouses and little crowded groceries and laboratories and flop houses. Its inhabitants are, as the man once said, whores, pimps, gamblers, and sons of bitches, by which he meant everybody. Had the man looked through another peephole, he might have said saints and angels and martyrs and holy men, and he would have meant the same thing. Now, another story I wrote a number, number of years ago, back in the 1930s, was called uh, Of Mice and Men. It has this part in it. When a bunch of hard-working hobos and bindle stiffs, barley bucking bows and bindle stiffs. I used to work with them when I was 15 years old when I uh, ran away from home. I was heading for Mexico where a man's a man for all that, but figured I needed some money. I got a job in South County, and that's where I met these fellas. Uh, I was only 15, but I was already a full-grown. I could do a man's work, but I wasn't part of the social arrangement there, so I spent more of my time over on the bunk uh, listening, to the, uh, listening to these guys come in after 12 hours of work, usually griping. But one time an idea took hold around this, around this table, and, uh, and uh, each man made a contribution to this idea. It seemed to take on a life of its own and became, the, for my, my mind and heart anyway, the start of, of, of mice and men. Uh, it's always bothered me to, when people were hurt or hungry or unnecessarily sad. But these guys uh, came out of it, and, and here's what they said uh, approximately. Uh, someday we could get the jack together and have a couple of acres of our own and uh, a little house, and a cow and pigs and, and chickens and, and live off the fat of the land. Yeah, we could have rabbits and, and chickens. And we'd have a big vegetable patch and a rabbit hutch. And when it rains in the winter, we'd just say the hell with going to work. Build up a fire in the stove and set around it and listen to the rain coming down on the roof. Yeah. Every Sunday, we'd kill a chicken or a rabbit. And we'd have a cow or a goat. And the cream is so goddamn thick you got to cut it with a knife and take it out with a spoon. Yeah, yeah, we'd just belong there. We'd just live there. Nobody could can us. Yeah. And we'd have an extra bunk. Suppose a friend come by. We'd say, why don't you spend the night? And by God, he would. Suppose a circus come to town or a carnival or or a ball game, or any damn thing. We'd just go to her. We wouldn't have to ask nobody if we could. We'd just say, let's go to her. And we would. Or we'd fling some grain to the chickens first and milk the cows, and then we'd just go to her. Yeah. Well, I wrote that story up in a, in a ledger, and I left it on the piano bench in our little house over on 11th Avenue in Pacific Grove, and, and my wife Carol and I went over to to Ed Ricketts's lab over there on Ocean View Avenue, and there was quite a party there. Ed, in addition to being the greatest marine biologist of his generation, or probably any generation, is a great lover of, of music and, 
and uh, oh, Flora and some of the girls were there, and Mac or Gabe and some of the boys, and we had a whale of a party, and then Carol and I uh, came back home to our little house over there, and I wanted to get a hold of that story and read it again before I went to sleep, and, but that ledger was torn apart and shredded and just scattered all over the house. The dog, Toby, and Airedale had gotten it. And I cornered Toby, I said, Toby, Hey, you must be a better literary critic than I'd given you credit for. So I followed Toby's advice and wrote that story again. I didn't pick it up and repatch it and put it back together. I just dredged it out of my mind and imagination again. It took about a couple of months, I suppose. And I didn't have a title for it, but I wanted to read it out loud to, a, to my good friend Ed Ricketts, a man that, that I can trust and I know his face. I can read his face and tell if the emotional music of the language is working when I read it out loud to him. When I was done with that story, he said, John, that is a fine story, but what's the title? I said, A Thing That Happened. He said, Wow, that's about the worst title I've heard. I said, Well, how about Something That Happened? He said, Yeah, that's even worse. He said, Do you remember a poem by Robert Burns called To a Mouse on turning her up in her nest with the plow, November 1785? Yeah, I do remember some of that wee, cowering, timorous beastie. And then Doc said, yeah, did, did you know that Robert Burns really was a plowman when he was a young man in Mockland in Scotland? And he did turn up a mouse with the plow. And uh, he could tell that this mouse was, was about to have her babies, and she'd had a beautiful nest, and he just ruined it, and he felt terrible. And mousy, I'm so sorry. And then he made this beautiful nest, and, and now where are you going to take care of your babies? It's November before the Cronreich call to Scotland, and, then Burns said, But Mousy, you are not alone. But Mousy, thou art to know thy lane in proving foresight to be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glai, and leave us not but grief and pain for promised joy. I said, Thank you, Doc. Now I have a title for that story. I'll call her Of Mice and Men. And that story went out, and some, uh, some people in New York City wrote me a letter, said they wanted to make a play out of it. I said, Go ahead. They did. A few months later, I got a letter from my publisher. He said, Steinbeck, congratulations. The play of Mice and Men has won an award on Broadway. You must come to New York City and give a speech to the drama critics circle and accept an award. I said, oh, no, you don't. I'm not going to, I'm not giving any public speech. I said, look at the fine print in your contract. So it turned out I was obligated to make this damned speech in New York City. So I, I said to them, uh, I've never met with any situation like this before, but I do recall a speech of appreciation made by a cowboy at a dinner where he had received a pair of silver spurs for a championship in ear-notching and castrating calves. Cheered to his feet, the winner stood up blushing violently and made the following speech. <clears throat> oh, come on, boy. Jeez. Oh, God damn it. Oh, the hell, and sat down to tremendous applause. This uh, brief speech exhibits all of the elements of greatness in composition, beginning, middle, end, a sense of self-deprecation, a soaring quality in the middle, and it ends not on a cynical or defeatist note, but in the realization that nothing he could say could adequately convey his feelings. He said, Steinbeck, ah, oh, fine speech, and I'll come and see the play. Oh, no, I'm not going to that play. There are too many people in there. I never did see the damned play. But I did go to some of the parties after the play. At one of these parties, I met a heart surgeon. In fact, he was the greatest heart surgeon in the world, as far as he could tell. He said, Steinbeck, this play of yours has given me a splendid idea. I believe I'll take a year off heart surgery and do a little writing. That is a fine plan, Doc. I believe I'll take a year off writing and do a little heart surgery. It occurred to me recently uh, when I was visiting Cannery Row that uh, just because a thing didn't happen doesn't mean it isn't so. And after all these years of writing stories and a bit of journalism as well, I decided that the writer is delegated to declare and to celebrate man's proven capacity for greatness of heart and spirit for gallantry and defeat, for courage, compassion, and love. 
in the never-ending war against weakness and despair, these are the bright rally flags of hope and of emulation. And I'll close with a, a thing I've been trying to work into a story for many years. It happened to my mother, my little sister Mary, Doc Ricketts, many people, but uh, here's the way I have it right now. Sometimes a kind of glory lights up the mind of a man. It happens to nearly everyone. You can feel it growing or preparing like a fuse burning toward dynamite. It is a feeling in the stomach, a delight of the nerves, of the forearms. The skin tastes the air and every deep drawn breath is sweet. Its beginning has the pleasure of a great stretching yawn. It flashes in the brain and the whole world glows outside your eyes so that a cricket song sweetens your ears. The smell of the earth rises chanting to your nose and dappling light under a tree blesses your eyes. Then a man pours outward a torrent of him and yet he is not diminished. As my mother used to say over in Salinas after certain formal occasions, that's all there is, there ain't no more. <laughs>